Hi everybody. So welcome to the next in our series of webinars around um, issues related to trauma-informed practice. And as you know, this is hosted by NHS England. And we're very grateful for their support. Uh, today, though, we have uh, our amazing co-chair of the national group who's going to chair this meeting. So I'd like to introduce to you Angie Sweeney. Over to you, Angie. Hi, thanks, Angela. Um, yeah, so as I said, really excited to have you all with us today. Really excited to be doing this topic just before Christmas. I think it's a nice one to end the year on. Um, and would it be OK to start putting the slides up and I'll explain a little bit about our first speaker who was um, hoping to join us. His name's Dominic McCoover Tuma. Um, unfortunately, he's given me permission to explain that his mother is bravely unwell and he's having to fly to Zimbabwe to see her. Um, so he's not able to make it here today, but he's also given me permission to give a, a taste of what he was going to talk about. Um, so Dominic, I've known Dominic for 20 years, coming up to 20 years. He's been working in this field for a long, long time, and he's got a huge amount of experience of working in the NHS sector um, and also grassroots and third sector spaces. Um, and what Dominic, I think, really wanted to get across was that there's a very big difference in the cultures between those spaces, so between um, mental health services, NHS spaces and the grassroots and third sector spaces. One of the differences that he wanted to highlight was the fact that there's a, a huge difference between coming into somebody else's gig and being invited to plan that gig from the outset. You might have to. Would everybody mind turning their mics off? Sorry, I think I can hear a bit of background. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so he likened it to um, being invited to panel be an existing structure, which he said is neither co-design nor co-production. And he talked about, or he would have talked about the fact that the diversity of values and principles that are demonstrated in grassroots and third sector spaces don't really lend themselves to working in a higher in hierarchical public service systems like the NHS. Um, so it was a real call to be mindful of those different cultures and practices and how they can act to prevent lived experience involvement and lived experience leadership. Um, Anne, could you move on? Thank you. So he was going to give some examples of some work that he's involved in at the moment, which includes a study looking at um, understanding what lived experience leadership is. Um, he was going to conclude who feels it knows it. Um, that slotting a survivor into a preset agenda won't add authenticity to any work programme because you can't fit a square into a round hole and that the value placed on the voice of lived experience determines the value placed on any approach, including trauma informed approaches. So I think it was a real kind of uh, challenge to us, challenge to people working in trauma informed approaches to really think about the way in which voices of people with lived experience are being included, including as leaders. Um, so it's a, a real shame that he couldn't be here, but hopefully that gives you a flavour of some of what he was going to talk about. And I'm posting in the chat um, a link to a video that he's done, a much longer video, so you can you can go away and watch that and learn a bit about what he's doing. Um, and can we move on to the next speaker? So our first speaker, which I'm really excited to to be introducing, is Jane Chavot. She's co-founder of Survivors Voices, which is a grassroots survivor-led organisation for people who have experienced abuse um, and they engage in peer support in survivor-led research and they also support organisations to involve survivors. They're really keen to collaborate with others so I'm going to put some details or, or Anne will put some details in the chat so you can find out more but for now I'll hand over to Jane. Thank you Angie, I'm really excited to be here. Um, so just to add what you said about me, um, I'm a survivor and um, I have a professional background in education and social care and really lived experience involvement has been part of what I've done since I was myself a young person and participated in um, youth assemblies and youth councils way back in the 70s and 80s because I'm very old. Um, so picking up really from what Dominic was saying, if we could go to the next slide, please, Anne. Um, I want to focus on two questions um, and it really it really um, picks up beautifully from from um, what he was going to say. So the first is what actually is authentic lived experience leadership and, and our experience as an organisation, you know, draws on two things. We are a survivor led organisation, so we do lived experience leadership as ourselves. And then we get invited by a lot of other organisations 
um, and services um, to support them to involve abuse survivors in research or in, in projects or in policy. And so we've developed this notion from our experience of authenticity of involvement and um, we, we've um, we kind of developed our own version of Einstein's ladder of participation to say that um, authentic lived experience leadership, as Donald was saying, is when we're at the table from the beginning. Um, for us, actually, the highest level um, of leadership is, is where the organisation or the project or the service is run by people with lived experience. So all of this are survivors because we're a survivor led organisation. And, and what we find is that often we're brought in um, to be consulted once a lot of the major decisions have been made. So so my, a question for you, a challenge really would be if you're trying to embark on in involving people with lived experience, um, then to how do you start from the beginning? Uh, and our, some of the things that we've discovered from that about what um, what does good lived experience leadership look like? Um, oh, I'm hearing an echo. Somebody probably needs to mute. Hope you can hear me okay. Um, so uh, another thing that we We've, so I've talked about the, um, the hierarchy of involvement and, and the importance of two participation, not taking them. I think the second thing is, is that, that um, what lived experience brings needs to be not just heard, but valued equally and acted on and not be like a second rate source of um, uh, knowledge um, or um, influence. Um, to professional experience and to recognize that some of us bring both so we bring professional and lived experience and sometimes we may up, be upfront about that and sometimes we may not feel able to be upfront about that and, and that those tensions need exploring um, which is why we think it's important that there's strong involvement networks uh, this is very lonely work and it can be very costly work uh, one of the points further down that it, that um, it, it's not easy to work with experience if those have been wounded experiences uh, and obviously in our field they often have been and so we need to ensure there's good support and peer support needs to be a big part of that and that needs to be planned and resourced and built in uh, and and finally that that um, our type my title was from pain to power and that was a phrase that was adopted by our, our survivor led research group as to what epitomised for them the experience of being involved um, is is that it was though the 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 journey that had brought them there um, was a very painful one. Um, it was actually empowering. They felt in, they'd empowered themselves by using that journey to transform things for others. Okay, next next slide, please. So the second thing I want you to think about is what might be some principles for lived experience leadership. And, and there are a number of resources around and, and I just want to talk about something that we did, which was to develop a charter for engaging abuse survivors in projects and research and development. And that can be downloaded for free from our website. Um, and we really encourage you to download it and use it. And we'd love to hear about it if you do. So, so there's a lot of principles in there, but basically our key principle was that any in any work that's done involving the, the lived experience of people who've who've been abused or, or subjected to violence should be the opposite of abuse and trauma. So whereas abuse is in silence, it should give us a loud voice, whereas abuse is hidden, the work should be transparent um, and accountable, whereas abuse um, is, is crushing, the work should be creative and joyful, whereas the abuse is harmful, the work we do should be promoting self-care. And the Charter has some suggestions about how we might do that. And so then again, we said, OK, so what does principled lived experience leadership look like? And three of the things I'd like to highlight around that is the first thing that it's it, there's a real intention to engage. So so if your organisation or your team want to be practising lived experience um, leadership, there's there's an effort to stand shoulder to shoulder with us. And, and and work together to create a collaborative environment and be very mindful and curious of attitudes that might 
inadvertently with all the best intentions but actually be re, re harmful or, or re-abusive and um or shaming um and and look work together to try and overcome um those kind of attitudes and actions and the second thing goes back to our joyful thing is is it is to celebrate what the power of of lived experience our experience with research is is that involving having survivor-led research changes the outcomes of the research and has huge benefits for the survivor researchers and we really want to make time in anything that we do to celebrate that to notice what difference we're making to make sure we measure that and capture that and to celebrate being being um, feeling empowered and having a voice it's so important to people and then thirdly again i mentioned it last time but that that good um leadership we think has to be supportive and so in our unpublished report about it we talked about a golden path of survivor-led activism and, and i just really love this idea that we're trying to say it's not just a process it's about a creative coming together of people um, that who are caring for each other uh, where everybody's participating and we facilitate that to happen in whatever way works uh, for them and that we have fun together that we enjoy what we're doing that we're playful it's not just something that ticks a box that that's just another procedure that we have to to get through and our experience is that when it does well it is i'm passionate about this i could go on talking for hours and i won't but but uh, but because it's brilliant it's the most amazing thing i do uh, and one of our survivors sums it up um, um, by saying, I'm here to try and turn shit into gold for others and for myself. And we call that the alchemy of lived experience leadership. Thank you very much. Jane, thank you so much. I think it's really important to have had a presentation from an organisation that's um, explicitly about abuse survivors and the involvement of abuse survivors as leaders. Um, in research and in practice. So yeah, fantastic. Thank you. I'm going to hand over now to um, John Lawler, who's who is chief executive, um, as you can see from the slide of Cumbria, Northumberland, Tynan, where NHS Foundation Trust, and he's going to be um, in conversation with Angela Kennedy. So I'll hand you over now. Thanks. Hi, John. Welcome. Hi there. Yeah, don't worry, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Great. We can't see you yet, I don't think. Oh, there you are. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us, John. My pleasure. My pleasure. I appreciate it. So we're going to have a short conversation, I think. And um, you uh, did a sum up at, at, the, at the summit that kick started this whole um, national program. So that was early last year. And at that, you talked a little bit about you know, your own lived experience and, and the motivation that that brings to your leadership role. And I was just wondering whether we should start with that, really, whether you think your role as Chief Executive of Mental Health Trust links to your lived experience or is it completely incidental? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, I've, I've done three different types of uh, uh, jobs, careers. I was a school teacher. I um, worked in the civil service in the Department of Health, and then I moved out into the uh, NHS. Probably the reason I would say that um, uh, it does relate to my lived experience is that I constantly say to staff that this is the best job I've ever done, working in the best organisation I've ever worked for. And I think that is not down, to the, 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 there's more than coincidence that that's because I'm working in an organisation that um, delivers mental health services and um, services for people with disabilities. Um, uh, so I think I would probably say it didn't necessarily um, uh, shape my career path, but it certainly has um, uh, contributed to um, how much I enjoy the job I do now. I mean, very briefly for people, uh, uh, I, I have um, a, a, a recurrent depression on the bipolar spectrum I have had for over 20 years. Um, and um, uh, I guess if, if, it, if it gives me nothing else, the pain of that helps me um, to at least some small degree be able to put myself in other people's shoes um, and perhaps understand, for example, if our services have let somebody down um, uh, or if we're looking at how we could go about introducing something new and making sure that we've got the voice of the, the person with the lived experience informing it. Um, so I think they've become much more entwined over the last uh, six years since I moved to CNTW than was the case before. I'm really interested, John, what motivated you to be open about it, because not everybody is. 
Yeah, I, th I think it's. I don't think it was a particularly conscious thing. I think I just am perhaps sometimes too open about things. Um, uh, so uh, I do, I do, I do remember when I'd um, uh, uh, had an attempt on my own life, uh, um, soon to be 17 years ago, that the person I worked for then told me never to tell anybody because it would uh, it would destroy my career. Um, uh, and so uh, that just gave me even greater resolve to make sure that I would tell people um, and that I would um, uh, basically say to them, uh, this is me, um, this is what you, what you see is what you get. If you don't want that because you're frightened of it, then I'm, I'm not going to take you to an employment tribunal. I happened to take that rather sort of almost aggressive um, uh, re reaction to it, but it was probably more a, because of an ab reaction to somebody telling me not to talk about it that led me to talk about it. It has um, it has ripple effects, though, the fact that you can talk about it. I wonder, uh, you know, not just for the service, but has it had an impact on you, do you think, being open about it like that? Yeah, I, 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 I certainly means that it's easier for me to say if I've come in and I'm in, I'm in a very dark place, but I come into work, it's easier to be able to tell people that I'm in a bad place um, because um, all of the team that I work with know that I have mental health issues. Um, so it certainly helped with that. Um, I think it also, and this might this might be less to do with my having a mental health issue, it might just be the type of organisation I'm in. I get more contact from staff in terms of emails sort of staring with me when they're when they're struggling with something in this organisation than having all the others I put together. Um, so that's either because it's just that's the type of organisation it is and it's got absolutely nothing to do with me and that's great if that's the case or it might be at least in part because people feel more uh, uh, yeah. sharing, sharing their, their struggles. Yeah, because you're modelling something important then, aren't you, about about the importance of reaching out for support and, and not feeling stigmatised. I think that's really um, vital. I, the, you know, often we can see mental health um, problems as, as being just all bad. But I wonder, do you, would you say there's been anything helpful about, and dare I ask this question, but is there anything helpful in your role about having experienced those things yourself? I mean, does it, as well as giving you that kind of empathy, is there anything else about it? Is there any yeah. value to it, I suppose? I, mean, I would certainly say it helps the job. I mean, I would never ever say there's anything helpful about suffering with depression uh, from, a, from a sort of personal point of view. Um, you know, I have some very, very dark days. I, I still do. I think in terms of the job, it is primarily the uh, um, attempt, because I could never claim to be successful, um, to be able to put yourself in other people's shoes, to empathise with them. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and I think that that then sometimes does enable me to almost act as a rather well-paid peer supporter. Uh, who's actually holding the mirror up to the face of the organisation? Um, uh, so, so I, I, acting really in a in a bit of a sort of a devil's advocate, sort of challenging and saying, "Well, if I was that person, I think that's what I would be feeling like when you said that." Um, mm. so I think it, it's probably mostly that putting myself in other people's shoes and hopefully um, showing a, a, a degree of empathy, um, but without ever claiming that I would understand how somebody yeah, else yeah. is, because uh, we're all different. At, so, uh, at the point at which we're suffering. So one of the things I know you've been motivated to do is set up the kind of lived experience co-production leadership programme in your own trust. Yes. And, I, yes. and I'm, I'm guessing that's um, kind of well valued there. But what, what do you think services can do more generally, you know, to make sure that co-production is at the heart of what they do, that they tackle the stigma around these issues? Yeah, we, uh, we we developed uh, our service user carer strategy. Well, when I say we, our service users and our carers and our carer and service user governors developed our service user carer strategy um, just over a year ago now, and it's called Together. Um, uh, and um, uh, that, if you like, provides a framework for the way that we would like staff and services to to, to work um, in true co-production with people. Um, uh, so I think there's a, there's a, if, if you like, there's a framework there within which we, we, we could operate. But I think for me, that at a more personal level, I, I'm just really keen that we get to a place where people feel it's okay to talk about their own experience, but without ever putting people under pressure. Um, uh, um, if you think about it, and we all know the statistics, and they're probably worse than this at the moment, we have 7,000 staff, so that means that at this minute in time, at least 1,200 of those staff are living with some form of mental illness. Um, so I would never wish to make people feel they have to talk about it, but I would like to get to a place where 
organisation, as a society, people are feeling more comfortable about um, uh, uh, sharing their experiences. Because I think that's quite powerful. Um, that's where our peer supporters, we've got over 40 peer support staff now and, and growing. Um, that's part of their job is to put themselves in the shoes of the service user uh, and the family and carers um, and to hold the mirror up to the to the to the faces of the the, the staff and the organization mm. but I think this, the other bit you mentioned briefly their stigma I, I I do think that that I, I certainly consider it uh, as a responsibility for me in my role to tackle stigma um, I, I recollect there was about four years ago um, over um, the Halloween period there were uh, lots of adverts of, um, of um, um, uh, outfits, in front of that phrase, fancy dress outfits, um, uh, which included people in straight jackets and a person holding a sort of a 12 inch hypodermic needle um, uh, in a cell that could not have looked more like an attempt to. Um, to, to, to uh, 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 and, uh, and so I sort of said I'll do some interviews and bizarrely I ended up being interviewed by Coventry and Warwickshire FM um, because it just got picked up so um, uh, I just think it's really important that we continue to make the progress we're making on tacking stigma, on tacking, tacking stereotypes and I do think there's been huge progress made in the last 10 years. Uh, sadly of course one of the, the downsides of that um, but it's a problem that you know, it's a good problem to have is that we're therefore constantly struggling to keep on top of the levels of uh, need that uh, that are presenting. Um, but I do think it's an organisational responsibility, um, it's a service responsibility, it's an individual members of staff responsibility, as well as broader society to constantly try and um, talk, 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 talk up, if you like, talk positively about people's achievements. We've had um, over 100 um, of our service users um, gain employment recently through a new service that's um, that's provided now. Um, individual placement support and just the, some of the stories of how that's transformed those people's lives are uh, you know sort of tear jerking really. John I'm so grateful for your time today and um, I think there's some questions that we might be able to pick up later. No problem yeah the chat if we have time but I, I think you know when you're talking about stigma and you're you're clearly modelling how to do that. That is the way forward. So thank you. We hugely appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. Um, I'm going to move on now to Kaj Roof, um, who I'm really excited to be introducing. Kaj is um, a consultant clinical psychologist and she's also a survivor um, and she's been increasingly involved in thinking about lived experience as a survivor practitioner. Um, so I'll hand over to Kaj now. Thank you very much, Angie, <clears throat> and hello, everybody. Um, if I can just please ask to make sure that your microphones are muted, that'd be really helpful. Um, I uh, thank you so much for asking me to speak today. I feel really privileged to be here. Um, and as a starter, I thought I would just take you briefly through my my journey. So this is a little collage that I'm going to swiftly take you through. Um, which contains some but not all parts of my journey and I guess it's coming from the viewpoint that personal is political. So I grew up in Liverpool, um, I am a person of colour, I've, I come from Bangladeshi, um, Irish and English heritage. I'm from an interfaith background, so um, my mum was Catholic and my dad practised Islam and I'm also from a working class background. I am a survivor of child abuse. Um, I was sexually abused for about eight years. I'm not entirely sure where it, when it began, um, but it did go on till till I was 15, um, whereupon my second disclosure was heard and believed. My dad, who was the person who abused me, was convicted. Um, I went on to write some resources for children and young people um, when I was 15, 16 years old, and I was very pleased that they were published when I was about 19, 20. Um, and I suppose that what provoked that was I was really shocked by the silence around abuse, that there was no kind of public conversation about child abuse um, when I was growing up, and no resources for young people at that time that, that I had been aware of. I was I genuinely thought I was the only one. 
I went on to study at university. Um, I studied psychology and then went on to psychology training. And I'm proud to work for the NHS. I'm based in Oxfordshire now. I'm also a committed trade union rep because how employees are treated at work is really important to me. Um, and it's often trade unions that are fighting for employee rights. So for instance, Unite the Union have just um, brought out a policy on supporting staff impacted by domestic abuse. And it's often tra uh, trade unions that are um, at the heart of equality. So that's something I'm very passionate about. And as a clinician, um, you know, I was fortunate to, to co-write some guidance on responding to non-recent abuse disclosures within therapy. That was something I co-wrote with Ben Awaits and Steve Weatherhead. As there was a practice gap, um, and it was a gap that I could see because I have lived experience that people are disclosing things in in clinical practice but were we actually inquiring any further about people's histories and how safe they were and how safe all the children might be i'm now 30 years into my career and it was publicizing the guidance that made me talk again about being a survivor um next please thank you and i think it's really helpful that people have talked about authenticity um, and that there's been a real transition from from going from victim to survivor to practitioner. The very things that drew me to the profession and which were openly accepted at application stage were then actively suppressed and problematized thereafter. I was very clear about my survivor status when I applied, but afterwards I felt I was there were uh, sort of efforts to declass me, to exoticise me, um, to not talk about my survivor status. And in essence, the message was you can't be both a survivor and a practitioner. And that's such a deficit model of having suffered psychological injury. Next, please. So recently, um, I, I kind of really interested in stories and who gets to tell stories and who gets to tell the stories about us. And I think there is a real and yet, as yet unnamed form of prejudice and discrimina discrimination against people who are survivors. I've written a letter to my professional magazine um, about that and there's a link, um, but it was really in support of those who were fighting more broadly a lived experience to be recognised. So Natalie Kemp has done a lot of work around this um, and integrate mental health. And there's now a DCP document from, from my professional body that's looking at the value of lived experience. Some of the quotes that I remember from um, my, my working life are things like, you talk a lot about abuse, it has been noticed. You can't do this project, it's too close for you. You're seeing abuse everywhere. You have issues. Next, please. So what's the process behind that? I think power and ethics are really central because who gets to set the landscape? Who has to who has the power to decide what stories are told about people? Who, how do how do survivors feature in research? And where is the texture that takes us be, beyond one thin narrative? and what is going on with a them and us culture. So for me, there's something really integral about power sharing and equality. Um, and, you know, we need stories that aren't fatalistic about surviving, that aren't automatically pa pathological. That is not the only story that exists. Um, and I think there are lots of unmapped zones um, where people have not had a say about what what surviving going through the, the transitions from victim to survivor look like. And we don't have uniformly safe spaces in which to speak out. <clears throat> and we need to recognise that that's intersectionally defined as well, that it's going to cost some people more than other people to voice their identities. Next, please. So who is not around the table when stories are told? And decisions are made. We need to widen social spaces 
and we need to make them physically and psychologically safe to speak into. And as far as I'm concerned, that's an issue of equal rights. Next. And then ideas on how to change this. I think somebody's got their mute off, um, but I'll keep going. Ideas on how to change this. I think we've got to reflect and understand institutional and organisational power and how that can act against people in both obvious and non-obvious ways. And social movements are really key. Grass movement, grassroots uh, movements, the power of survivor voices is absolutely key and central to this. Um, we need to change public awareness about abuse. And I think that is changing in the 30 years that I've journeyed. I can see how much it's changing. Um, and we need to change those stories so that people have rights to access help as needed. The impacts of psychological injury can be reduced. Abuse is preventable if we act together. We all have a part to play in that if we're truly committed to changing things. I think it can be done. So thank you for inviting me and thank you for listening today. Absolutely fantastic, Kaj. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's going to be generating a lot of thoughtful reflection in people. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. I'm going to move us on to Ray Waddingham so that we still have some time for questions at the end. We're hoping to have um, some questions and answers. So Ray is um, a very well known survivor, trainer, researcher, activist, um, and they're going to be talking about a project that they've been involved in on lived experience leadership. So I'll hand over to Ray now. Thank you. Um, huh. I was too busy listening to what everyone else was saying to know what I'm going to be saying. And I think some of what I want to say cross cuts the things that have already been mentioned, which is probably a nice place to be beginning. What I'm going to talk about today is a project that I was engaged in um, to lead on by Mind and then Ensign on this thing called lived experience leadership. It's a mapping project, not formal research, but it's basically to find out what's going on around England and Wales. How are people feeling about this term? How does it sit with them? What are the challenges? And what, if anything, could these charities do to support its growth? It's a really hot topic to be working on and quite a scary one for me because I know that it's a quite a diversive, divisive, uh, diversive, two words in one, um, divisive word leadership. It evokes a lot of strong feelings in the people that I've spoken with. And I was a bit worried about coming into this and just running roughshod over people that have already felt very excluded from these conversations. Thankfully, a lot of people have wanted to get involved. So I've done um, an online survey where over 100 people have uh, contributed, about 33 interviews so far, seven focus groups, and I'm hoping to kind of write it up in January. Um, it's been available in Welsh and also Easy Read, and there's been a real kind of commitment to try and reach out to people that don't normally get involved in these conversations, but it is limited, as always. Um, there's a lot of digital exclusion. We do try and get around that, but at the moment in COVID times, it's really hard just to sit down and chat with someone. So what have I found? Lots and lots of things, but just thinking what might be useful today. Just about everybody that um, has got involved has really talked about this commitment to doing something with the stuff you've gone through. I think someone talked about it is, is turning the shit into gold. That's very much come up in all of the different conversations I've had that we've been through stuff in our own lives and we want to make it useful to help others. We don't want other people to go through the same stuff. Um, there's lots of words for this, higher purpose, vocation, values driven. But it means a similar thing, I think. Yet there are loads of differences within the people that I've spoken with. And the differences start to emerge when we think about, well, the ways people understand the term leadership and what it means, their feelings about it, the way they approach what it is they're trying to change in how they do what they do and what it looks like in practice. And the hope of the report is to not provide a sort of single unitary, this is what lived experience leadership is, voice, which is, is artificial, is to really share some of these different threads and think about them as embedded within contexts. Because context is crucial. Um, 
the people I've spoken with come from lots of different areas and they're trying to make change in lots of different ways. They're engaged in activism, some people within the NHS, large voluntary sector organisations, which are very different beasts to smaller grassroots initiatives, and some are a bit of both. Um, training and education, research, policy on local, national and international levels. One of the interesting threads I've kind of been thinking about recently is this, this kind of dynamic between seeing leadership as an entity, and it's all about the leader, the characteristics, the things you need to be as a leader, how you are. And it's, it's a very person orientated thing that some people are leaders and some people are followers as if this kind of stays static. And then the other way I've been looking at it is leadership as a kind of a relational process, thinking much more about the context, the history and the relationships that construct what this leadership thing might be or what it might look like and who might take it on at any one time. Um, I think within people's inputs, I found this tension between um, a focus on the leaders, this entity approach, maybe sometimes a suspicion about the leaders and what it means to be a leader. So it's leaders as having a sense of pressure, you know, it's someone that we can follow or believe in, the expectations of what it should be to be a leader, how we're perceived by others, charisma and this role of humility and humbleness, being a servant leader. Um, and then also this other impact of the wider social, organisational and political realities that we're trying to create change within. And it shapes what is possible, um, what can be spoken about and how we even think about this thing called leadership and how we might relate to other people um, whilst we're trying to get change to happen. One of the ways in which I've seen this sort of play out, um, think about the origin story. Why do we get into this? And certainly for me and other people I've spoken to, sometimes that can involve great degrees of harm. We've already heard about this today. Um, things like trauma within our early life, trauma within society, racism, um, classism, misuse of power, sometimes harm at the helping services, the people who are meant to protect us. And this kind of can give us a, a reason, that vocation to try and get in there and do something. Yet it also involves really close connections with those same systems that can replicate this, this harm, this um, it could be through employment, say in the NHS, um, it could be through doing activism outside of these systems, but then interfacing with them. Um, it can include working with power inequalities and continually having it reinforced that you are not of equal power or equal status. It can be around the double speak, you know, actions and words being very different. We value you and yet we don't value you. Um, it can be around being silenced or unheard. So we're there at the table trying to say things, but nothing changes. Um, feeling othered, um, devalued, the compromises we might feel that we have to make in order to stay at the table, the shame and the guilt that can come from being part of a system which we know is still harming others. And all of this is whilst we recognise the immediacy, like in a really embodied way, and the extent of the unmet need out there. There's kind of, there's an endless amount of things that need changing and the pain that we see people experiencing as a result of that can be overwhelming. And so there's that question of how do we take care of ourselves in amongst that and each other, whilst also trying to create change without taking it all on ourselves? Um, how do we name the exploitative and crazy making nature of the context that we're working in? Because they really do echo sometimes the reasons we struggled in the first place. Finally, the sorts of concepts I've been playing with in this are things like relational leadership, authentic leadership, collective leadership. But one I'm going to talk about is disruptive leadership. Um, in disruptive leadership, I'm thinking about how is it that we can resist individualization? So creating collectives, having a fluid leadership where we're not just being positioned and stuck in one, one sort of power hierarchy, but we're actually looking around us, going, how can we lift each other up? It's about creating space for others and leadership in practice, not necessarily wearing the badge, although we might wear it at some times. Strengthen our diversity rather than aiming for a single voice and resisting the single narrative. 
um, creating support networks. Someone's even suggested a union, which I think is an amazing idea. We sometimes need someone in a position of power to stand with us if we're approaching a big organisation who's treating us badly. It's about reconceiving leadership on our own terms and really taking time to question where did our ideas about leadership come from? Because they often came through very hierarchical, um, power heavy structures that have been harmful to us. So can we step by, back from that and sort of reevaluate what it is we want lived experience leadership to look like and how we want to go forwards rather than just replicating what we've been given? Um, I think ultimately it's about generating spaces where we can talk and really reflect on what it is that we're doing and how we can use our experiences to engender change in a way that doesn't leave people behind or replicate those structures that can be so harmful and crazy making. So there's lots more to be said about all this. It's a fascinating project, but I hope that's been useful to share just a few of my thoughts with you. Um, thank you. Right, amazing to hear some of the themes coming out. It's it's incredible. And already I think one of them links to a really important um, question and comment that we've had. Um, and it was from um, Tamar who said that um, they work as a lived experience consultant and that the people around them are often unaware or unexperienced in the brutal reality of what that means to be a lived experience consultant, um, that it's a specialism in itself and that teams maybe need to be trained before people with lived experience come in um, and the harm that grave harms that can be inflicted on people when that doesn't happen um, and I wondered if you had any thoughts about that or if that kind of issue had come up very much and it sounds from what you were saying like it had. Yeah so I think we often place the responsibility on the person with lived experience to educate and be the role model and do this but we forget actually how toxic and harmful some of these structures are and some of your colleagues might be being without anyone really knowing or acknowledging that. The bit that um, I'm particularly interested in, let's see if I can remember it. Oh, um, come on, you can do it. Yes. A friend of mine who's also a survivor um, from Australia said these brilliant words, um, my tears and my critique. And we were talking about how as a survivor, if we show emotion, it can be pathologised and seen as because we, we're coming from a discredited position already. People are expecting us to go mad. So if we show emotion, it can be seen as part of the illness or the pathology. Yet, actually, we're kind of some people call it canaries in the coal mine. You know, we can I can feel these inequalities and the stuff that's around in the whole organisation. And it has an impact on my body that should be celebrated and valued. And then we can form words and say what it actually is. But instead, we tend to try and squish it, pathologize it, individualize it and leave the person who is experiencing it on the edge and left as if they're crazy rather than being heard. So that's a long way of saying yes to more very much. Thank you. Right. Does anybody else want to come in and answer that question? We've got quite a few questions in the chat so we can move on unless somebody else would like to come in and, and offer some thoughts on that. So I'm going to um, ask one of the earlier questions, which is about ensuring that organ. Oh, Kat, did you want to come in there? Sorry. No, sorry. I, well, no, I need to say I've, 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 you know, ra raised points. Uh, I fully endorse them. So yeah. powerful. Thank you. Um, actually, it'd be great if speakers, if you do want to turn your um, cameras on now, um, that would be great. And then you can kind of give a wave when there's something that you want to answer. Um, so, yeah, there was a question about ensuring that organisations are accountable um, because um, we know that it's not always done in the best way. There was some people talked about tick box involvement um, or coming together in creative ways, but then nothing uh, emerges from that. How do we make sure that organisations can be held accountable for the way in which they um, enable and support lived experience, leadership and involvement? Can I come in on that, Angie? Yeah, please do, Jane. Um, and I see you've got a question for Kaj as well. Oh, oh no, it was just, it was, I was just going to pick up on, on what Tamar said. Um, so just to say that quickly first, I'm so so sad that that's been your experience. And, and I do think that's a really, really vital issue 
that, that, that before there's any new kind of lived experience projects um, or people brought in, that the work, the groundwork is done to ensure that, that that's going to be done safely and that 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 um, that, peop that it's approached not with a defensiveness, but with a curiosity of how are we going to learn and change by inviting these people to work with us. And until there's that attitude of curiosity and welcome, then I, yeah, I think it, it can be dangerous and it's important that that groundwork is done first. Um, and so then that leans on to the second question. I guess I was saying that's why we well, that's why we wrote the charter is that we feel there should be a set of clear principles and there are a few others you know there are there's other work uh, uh, around that's been there's a lot of other work around that's been done on that in terms of BPI standards and so on but 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 that any organization um, working to involve more people with lived experience um, needs to have some clear principles and then adopt those with people with lived experience as part of the work and and then there's an accountability are we meeting those principles um, it would be interesting to have an outside body. It would be one of my dreams if Survivors Voices could set up its own kind of quality standards, set of quality standards that people could sign up to uh, for, for good user involvement. And um, uh, uh, one, I'm hoping that one day I'll have the, the resources to do that. Thank you, Jane. Oh, Kaj, did you want to come in? Yeah, I love Jane's answer. Um, I, I, fully endorse that. I think in terms of account accountability, organisations really need to be meaningfully signing up to charters that are actually designed by survivors. Um, as yet, there is no standardised landscape around that. And we're obviously we're having a lot of discussions at the moment about um, inequality that's been highlighted during the period of COVID and particularly around racism. And I, I think that um, you know, there are a lot of parallels for me around racism. I think racism needs to be regarded as a safeguarding issue um, because of the barriers that it places on people's access to, to help and health. Um, and that actually when you look at um, anti-racist training, there is no standardised uh, sort of uh, uh, quality mark around what good looks like. And I think there are similar issues around that for for being uh, providing accountable and helpful services to survivors and how we include survivors at every level of organisational planning and service delivery. So I'd love to see that happening. Can I? Oh, sorry, Ray, you go ahead. I'll try and be quick. I'll just yeah. raise a slight counterpoint and I'm going to worry about the idea of accountability not because accountability is bad I think accountability is essential but I think we're so far away from that being possible because there's still not the will and the belief that lived experience is truly should be the heart of what we do that it should should have a central voice so we can have tick boxes and accountability and standards but if the will and the belief and the accept that that stuff isn't there it kind of it can just be tokenistic again. So how do we change the CEOs, the team leaders, all the way through the organisations? Um, yeah. Otherwise, I don't know. We've had quite a lot of involvement um, standards over the years, and I don't think changed much. I think that's critical, and actually, it relates to one of the comments that was posted earlier on, and a question which was um, uh, somebody said that when they're engaging with leadership, um, people with lived experience they can engage with, but people without lived experience might be harder to engage with. And how might we start overcoming that? Because if the current leadership, if the will is not there, how do we get past that? Uh, the fact that the cultures aren't going to change. Can I just I'll just ask you that question and then, and then I'll go to Stuart Mitchell, whose hand's raised. Did somebody else want to answer? Sorry, I'm going to come in. Sorry, for some reason I, I don't seem to have the um, the, the, the hand um, icon to be able to. Um, uh, sorry, it's John Lawler here. Uh, I, I was just going to say the issue around culture. Sometimes you just have to um, uh, uh, have a lot of people that are spread across the organisation that are changing the culture bottom up. Um, if there is any resistance to um, to, to the types of um, um, cultures that we're looking for. Uh, it takes time, but but uh, I think that um, 
some of the some of the stuff that's happened in the organization i'm in now uh, absolutely no credit to me at all has come entirely bottom up where somebody has just tried something out in an area and it's got traction and others have um, embraced it just to, a sort of slightly more negative point, um, uh, we did have um, experience with some of our first peer supporters that we hadn't really properly prepared the service for those people to join them. So they were they've been told by the board manager, for example, well, you can't be in that meeting because we're talking about staff, uh, talking about patients. Um, so we had to, we had, had to sort of do quite a lot of standing back and saying, hmm, we probably had just made made massive assumptions that people would see the value of having somebody as part of their team supporting them in making this, this decisions about the um, MDT um, uh, response to a particular sort of service need for a person, either with the person in the room, the, the service user, or without. Um, so I remember when I first met with some of our peer supporters, that's about four of them told me they had an absolutely horrendous experience in not being welcomed into the particular part of the organisation. Fortunately, it's five years ago now, so hopefully it's a bit better. But I'm just really supporting the point about you really have to Put time and effort into investing in enabling uh, enabling people with lived experience to be fully, um, uh, if you like, appreciated by the organisation and the services. Thanks, John. I just want to acknowledge as well um, <clears throat> to, to Mars' um, comment about the kind of scary, exhausting place that you can get to when the organisation isn't supporting you and when these things are very difficult and plain, painful. And also um, the use of the word shame is, I think, really important. And, and that can come into um, the way in which lived experience is treated often, I think. And I'm really sorry, again, to, that you're going through that. Um, I just wanted to allow Stuart Mitchell, who's had his hand raised for a while, to come in and ask the question, if that's OK, Stuart. Thanks, Angie. Um, all right, it's good to hear. Um, you know, so many people talk about these things, and every single uh, presentation has had something very powerful, you know, within it. I would just want to, you know, make a comment really, and um, you know, see what people think. Is that I think that all of us have lived experience. Uh, I, I, you know, very much doubt that that there's anybody that works 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 in the NHS or in, you know mental health does not is not free from pain and emotional suffering. So I think that all of us is just you know we don't all speak about it. Um, so you know I think that's. A, that's that's kind of one thing I think you know uh, there's a common humanity but uh, you know I like Ray's idea of uh, you know relational you know leadership and uh, I think it's so important the way we talk about these things and the way we hear hear other people's voices and we allow those voices to be heard I think it can be quite a subtle process where at times it's easy to shame other people when they express their voice uh, by you know, using concepts and language and power uh, to kind of, uh, you know, make them feel as though they haven't really been heard. I think it's, you know, bad enough we go through trauma and adversity, but it's the reaction when you do talk that is so, so key. Um, so, so I kind of try and take that, let's hear everybody's voice here, and I try to make sure that everybody's voice, you know, gets heard. I'm a leader, but I do try that kind of empowering kind of voice acknowledgement kind of process and um, uh, but I just think you know some organizations are so big I think you know we do end up you know becoming quite you know shaming organizations and that's something I think um, you know needs needs a great deal of work uh, and John John I'm sure is uh, behind me in that and you know that's what we're trying to do in our trust so just those thoughts uh, I think but uh, you know very powerful and uh, you know thanks Thanks so much, Stuart. I think we're just going to have two more questions. We've got one in the chat and then John Slater. So I'll just ask the one in the chat quickly, which is when you work on culture from the bottom up, how do you overcome those barriers that leadership teams can put in place, which is something we've touched on a little bit so far? Yeah, that's a hard one, isn't it? Sorry, it's John over here again. Uh, I guess, I guess, um, in, in some senses, if you, um, uh, as long as you, the leaders believe in leadership and developing leaders, um, then, um, uh, then, then having uh, leadership development programs operating across an organisation means that um, in time, um, whatever, whatever the fa faults and foibles of the um, senior leaders in the organisation, um, uh, the ability to unleash people's um, leadership, leadership skills and capacity and capability. 
once you've got a leadership program, it it, it, it will happen. But I recognise that's incredibly simplistic. Um, but it's just about finding allies, isn't it? Really, identifying others that are going to work um, uh, with with the same uh, with the same objective, if you like. Um, uh, the organisation that, that I'm in um, uh, is attempting to be a very empowering, devolving organisation that lets people have um, uh, uh, freedom to try things out. Um, but if you haven't got that, you just have to find ways of, um, uh, of creating your own your own um, sort of safe spaces by identifying people with um, like minded who are trying to change things. Uh, I, I'm confident that you can do it in both environments, but I entirely accept it's much harder if um, the uh, uh, the all pervading sort of nature of the organisations culture from the top um, uh, is um, discouraging of that. But I would just say to people, please don't give up. Thank you. Um, John Slater, I don't know if you want to have the final comment or question before we close. Oh, you're on mute, John. There we go. Sorry, every time. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm somebody with um, with lived experience and um, sexually abused a child and, and all the things I've been through with mental health services trying to reach the, the right support. Uh, and as part of that, I've, I've ended up being involved in committees and goodness knows what um, from a lived experience um, perspective. And, and I'm just thinking at the moment, you know, what what concerns me is I I work for an organ a part work part time for an organisation called Drinkwise Age Well, and they've brought together service users or people with lived experience would be a better word. Uh, professionals and researchers all working together to find new creative ways to work with issues around alcohol and, and mental health. And I'm quite concerned at the moment that we have uh, a, a new community mental health framework being drawn up, we're being discussed, people looking at how that's going to be implemented. And I'm really concerned if, if we do that without the voice of lived experience and I mean involved in the design of those services then I don't think we're going to reach a different paradigm and my concern is we're just going to end up with with much the same uh, as we've already got and, and I think the prime example of how we can get it wrong is is the idea that you, you're going to involve lived experience but it's a bit like an architect you know uh, wanting to involve the people who are going to live in this building that they're building and they invite the people in at the end to uh, to pick the curtains so you know we could really come to a different a different place if you're willing to take that initiative so i hope that's going to happen but i i often feel like i'm continually hoping uh, i feel like my main task is is to plant trees but i may never see them grow this process is so slow but I hope it may make some change. Thank you. It's a great note to end on, John. Thank you. Um, so we, we have come to the end of the session now. Um, I, it feels like we've just scratched the surface of what hopefully will be an integral part of the conversation around trauma-informed approaches going forward. I think it has to be um, for all the reasons that we've talked about today. Hopefully we can have some more events on this topic going forward. There'll be lots of resources um, placed on the Trauma Informed Community of Change website as well. Um, and I just wanted to finish by saying that I hope that, that what we've done at least is start to challenge that thinking around there being people who provide care and support on the one side and people who receive it on the other. Actually, it's much more complex than that our identities and what we bring is much more complex um, and, and hopefully we'll keep learning in future events and please do check out those further resources um, thank you so much for coming everybody and have a great christmas and we shall see you next month hopefully for the next webinar